Welcome to the Road to Canton, a Hall of Fame special to discuss the careers of wide receiver Art Powell and cornerback Eric Allen, two of the many greats to put on the silver and black. Art is one of the three senior candidates selected as finalist for the class of 2024. Eric has been a semifinalist for the past four years, but is named one of the 15 finalists this year for the first time. Thanks for joining us. I'm JT The Brick. On today's show, we'll be hearing from teammates, coaches, and those who covered these two men's careers to properly illustrate why they both belong in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Art Powell's career ended in 1968. That's five years before the mobile phone was invented. So it's understandable if you aren't familiar with just how dominant he was during his playing career. Powell had over 8,000 receiving yards and 81 touchdowns in eight seasons as a full-time receiver. Now, that might not seem eye-popping, but remember, this was back when they were only 14 games per season, and the term airing it out wasn't necessarily a thing. Take just his 1964 season, when he averaged 97.2 receiving yards over a full season. In 2023, only three receivers topped that number. Powell was ahead of his time, and today you will hear why, starting with our first guest, former teammate Gus Otto. So, Gus, tell us an early story about Art Powell, because you were there, and he's a great player, burgeoning player in this league, dominant player. What were your early memories meeting him? Well, of course, I was a rookie, you know, and I was just afraid to be around him almost. <laughs> you know, he had so much honor for the, uh, for the veterans back in those days. But uh, he was very, he was very respectful and very quiet. You know, he didn't uh, he wasn't bombastic or anything like that. So he was just a, a great teammate. Gus, how dominant was he when you practiced with him? The eleven angry men that you turned out to be one of the great Raider defenders of all time. What do you remember seeing with him, with his size, his speed, and his dominant play? I remember how smooth he was and how large his hands were. You know, he, he could, you know, I hate to think what he would have caught today with gloves on. You know, back in those days, we didn't wear gloves. You could ask Freddie about that, you know, but uh, he caught the ball very well without gloves. He had good, good hands, soft touch, and ran uh, precise patterns. Yeah, you know, Gus, it's interesting. Was this the definition of Mr. Davis and the vertical game, the type of player he dreamed of early in his career as an owner and a GM and a coach, obviously the type of player that Mr. Davis wanted going forward. Well, I didn't know if he was the exact, uh, you know, speed wise, we had Bo Roberson on that team too. And he was an Olympic sprinter. So you knew what, what uh, Al was looking for. Also, uh, you know, Art had ran great patterns, but he also ran deep very well. So he was the beginning of maybe our, uh, run the you know, deep uh, passing game. And Gus, how competitive were those practices back in the day? Because as one of the leaders of the defense, you all of a sudden, you, were, you want to stop the run, but all of a sudden you look behind you and there's a deep ball going to Art Powell. Well, we were happy about that because we were <laughs> practicing, you know. Yeah. We weren't playing against each other, but I was rooting for him all the time. What was it like as a teammate to be in a battle with him, knowing you were playing in some of the biggest games, early games in Raider history, and you had him as a teammate leading you out of the tunnel. Well, you know, Art was uh, was a great leader, and he was he was very quiet leader. He wasn't uh, a yeller type leader. He just did it by example, and everybody had a lot of respect for him. And I think uh, you, you see leaders like that today that uh, they lead out of uh, respect from the other players around them. Gus, why does he deserve to be in the Hall of Fame? I mean, this has been a long wait for him, and some of your former teammates had to wait a long time, too. What is the reason why Art Powell should be a Hall of Famer? Well, you know, statistically, he, he's got he's right up there statistically, maybe a little bit behind some of the Hall of Famers. However, uh, uh, he was going through a little different time in those days, and he was leading not only leading the, the Raiders, but he was also leading – a lot of the, the black players because they were being discriminated against in certain areas. And, uh, and he put his foot down and, and took a bold stance and uh, did, you know, things like the, the all-star game where he boycotted and what had you, uh, when uh, they, they wouldn't let him eat in the same restaurant. And so he had a lot of things on his mind. He, he had a, a very serious streak to him too, but uh, 
he had the uh, fortitude and the and the desire and, and, and the strength mentally to uh, to attack those problems and to deal with them. Perfect way to sum that up, Gus. Really needed you on this one because you played with him. He was your teammate. Thanks so much for joining us to talk about the legacy of our pal in the Hall of Fame. Okay, JT, good seeing you. Thank you. Coming up, former teammate and AFL All-Star linebacker, Paul McGuire joins the show to discuss what it was like trying to defend our pal. To be a Raider is to be bold, powerful, and loyal. What's a Raider? Always a Raider. Raider Nation family is authentic. With the heart here in Las Vegas, we are often imitated, but can never be duplicated. Why? The autumn wind is a Raider. Because there is only one nation. Keep up with the 2023 season by downloading the mobile Raiders app or visiting Raiders.com slash connect for scores, where to watch, and what's happening next. In our hopes, to build the Oakland Raiders into an outstanding professional football organization. Al had said, we need point scorers. He came up with Art Powell of San Jose State, the finest end in professional football. Al Davis revolutionized offensive football with his emphasis on the vertical passing game. He wanted to stretch the field, and one of his first moves after taking over as the Raiders head coach in 1963 was to bring in Art Powell. In his first season under Davis, and the new passing attack, Powell led the league in receiving yards and touchdowns, averaging a whopping 17.9 yards per catch. In comparison to the receivers this year, Art Powell would rank number two in yards per reception and number one in receiving touchdowns. Let's not forget, this was in an era where running the ball was emphasized and quarterbacks were given a lot more freedom when handling receivers during the play. To talk more about Powell's career, let's bring in another former teammate, the great Paul McGuire. Paul, we're thrilled to have you. First off, describe Art Powell as a receiver. Well before he was your teammate and defending him, what did he look like, his size and his presence on a football field? Well, he, you know, he's one of those guys when we played against the Raiders and he played, he, <clears throat> you had to put two people on him. Uh, I think that's what in, back in the 60s when they really started doing it, you know, you put a, a, a safety over top and that was one of the only ways that we really knew how to, how to you know, cover him because he had he had just such great hands. I mean, there, uh, you know, he's one of those guys that was well before everybody that it was a big man that can run and catch. But his motto was, I swear this is true. Throw me the ball. That's all he ever said was <laughs> to the quarterback. I talked to Flores the other day about it, and he says, yeah, he always said, throw me the ball. Throw me the ball. Okay. Well, we, so we got the same kind of guy here in Buffalo. Yeah, we know how tight you are with Tom Flores, your best friend, and he threw the ball to Art Powell. Was, it, was he more of a deep threat over the middle of the field? We, the highlights are amazing, Paul, and you've had such a great broadcasting career. Can you imagine if we looked at a guy nowadays in 2024 – on all of these highlight shows, putting on the shows that Art Powell was able to do in the prime of his career? Well, you know, he, he was one of those guys that that uh, I thought, you know, because we're never in the, in the offensive meeting. I was on defense most of the time. But he's one of those guys that, that really looked at film and looked what the defensive backs were doing. He knew where the openings were. <laughs> Excuse me. He reminds me a little bit uh, much faster than – but Kelsey with, with the uh -huh. Kansas City Chiefs, you know, he get he finds an opening and he sits down in it. And if you if you watch him, uh, this is something that those two uh, Mahomes and Kelsey look at when they look at film. Where are the opening and when he comes across the line? Because if you if you look at what Kelsey does, it's like a three yard pattern and then he gets open. Art Powell was the kind of guy that can run a 12 yard pattern and still get open. And that's where the problems come in. You really had to put a safety on him. You couldn't, you couldn't cover him with a corner. He was just bigger than every corner that we had in those days. Paul, tell me why he should be in the Hall of Fame. You know the politics and players in their prime and then the seniors list and then a player passes away. You, you handled Tom Flores brilliantly with us in the building, talking about coach who had to wait too long. 
Now we get back to Art Powell again. Why is this the right time for Art Powell to gain enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame? Well, you know, uh, you just you, all you have to do is go back and take a look at what he did in the era that he did it in. You know, don't I? You see it too many times, and you listen to announcers let their pardon me when I say this let their ass override their minds by saying you know this guy should have been and could have been well he then he would have been mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the thing Art Powell is one of those guys that changed the game the passing game so when you look at him you you know you look at all the things that he did all the all the touchdowns that he caught all the passes that he caught and all the things just take a look at what he did for the game in those days he was one of those guys that actually people tuned in to watch play because, you know, when we looked at him on, when we were looking at defensive film and we're watching him, you went, you're thinking to yourself, how the hell do you cover him? Right. You know, because he just knew he studied so well, he knew what to do in the game situation. And when you look at what, what he accomplished when he played compare it to now, put him in. You know, Paul, Don't hesitate. Yeah, Put him in. Yeah, Paul, one more on this. I'm looking at the numbers against Fred Bolitnikoff and Don Maynard, two that you know very well, and competed against. And now I'm looking at numbers that are comparable to Randy Moss, Devontae Adams, and Larry Fitzgerald. That is very rare that a player could stand up over the test of time that many years, and Art Powell seems to be that player. Then you got to reward him for it. You know, uh, you know, there, there's how many times have we heard this thing? You know, Al Davis is the guy that recruited me at the Citadel, and I've known Al since 1956, actually 55. Mm -hmm. And he's a great coach. And there has been a lot of things say, well, this guy's not going to go into the, the Hall of Fame because of Al Davis. Wait a minute. Al Davis says the only thing he did was t teach the guy how to how to run patterns where to hell, you know, look for the ball, when to catch the ball, and how to catch the ball. So, you know, if he did anything for Art Powell, he just made him what he is, what he was then in, in those days. And again, you keep bringing it up, and it's absolutely true. Look at the numbers. The numbers don't lie. You know, uh, he he was the kind of guy that just, uh, I mean, he loved to play he, he, because he knew he was so much better than, than the guys who were covering him. <laughs> so, you know, uh, just take a look at him and, and reward the guy. It, it doesn't take a whole lot to, to realize that, that this guy belongs in the Hall of Fame. Paul, it's always a pleasure. You're a legend. We really appreciate you as we look back at the legacy of Art Powell, and hopefully this is his year to get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. All the best to you and your wife. I hope so. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You guys are doing a great job out there in Vegas. Hey, everything's going to turn around for you. It's going to. You've got the people. Now all I got to do is put him on the, on the field and tell him where to play. <laughs> He'll be all right. Appreciate you. Coming up, Hall of Famer Ron Wolf stops by to talk about his early days of scouting Art Powell and why he deserves to wear a gold jacket. The Raiders always had a receiver who could stretch the field back in those days. The first guy was Art Powell. When Al brought to Art Powell in, I had never seen a guy who could run passwords like Art Powell. He still holds the record today for the most touchdowns in Raider history of 16 in one season. Art was a technician. I mean, he knew how to work the defensive backs. He knew how to move their feet and how to get around them, and he had tremendous hands. And he could get up in the air. I mean, he could get that alley-oop type play. Art was just a very cunning football player. He was just a very smooth athlete. I mean, he used to have a great post-corner move. Nobody could stop him. Ball would get out. It was always going to pile. I could always remember looking back for the ball, and I see it throw, and I look back the other way. There's Powell catching along with him. Art Powell could play any place you put him, but he was best on one-on-one -on -one because he was impossible to cover one-on-one. -on -one. And he had tremendous hands. He could catch anything. That was his power. Art Powell deserved to be in the Hall of Fame. He's a forgotten man in the history of the game just by the way things evolved. Games have been played more than 100 years, and now, 55 years after he last played, 
Our pal is the number two player in touchdowns receiving per game. He averaged 1,000 yards a season. He was a champion, skilled beyond belief, fast for a man of his size, tougher than the Dickens, a marvelous pass receiver, a marvelous football player. play guy and started bringing in guys that could do that, that kind of stuff. A guy like Art Powell who was really a good receiver, a deep receiver. The most important thing in football is scoring points and very few are as prolific as Art Powell in finding the end zone. In NFL history, only 12 players have had five or more seasons with 10 plus touchdown receptions. Art Powell's one of them. Of those 12, seven are in the Hall of Fame and the ones that aren't are Larry Fitzgerald, Rob Gronkowski, Devontae Adams, and Mike Evans. It's safe to say they'll be putting on a gold jacket at some point in the future. And I remind you that most of the guys on that list have done it in the modern era of football where the game favors the offense. Even more impressive, here is the NFL's all-time leaders in receiving touchdowns per game. Art Powell had a touchdown in three out of every four games he played. All but one of these names are in the Hall of Fame. Art Powell was one of the most productive scorers in NFL history. It's time he's treated like that. We now welcome in Hall of Famer and legendary scout for the Raiders and one of the greatest talent evaluators in the history of professional football, Ron Wolf. So Ron, as a Hall of Famer, you drafted and evaluated so much Hall of Fame talent. Let's begin with Art Powell and his skill set. What made him such a special player? I think he was a rare player in the sense that uh, he was big, he was very versatile, uh, different era, as, uh, as you well know, where you could do anything to a receiver. And, and uh, I'm talking about the defense could and he reacted accordingly. I can vividly recall him going across the middle and just relaxing as the pass is being thrown to him, knowing he's going to get the crap kicked out of him as soon as he catches the ball. He's a rare player. You have to understand when he played, 33-man squad limit. So he had a double when guys got hurt on the defensive side of the ball as well. He was a remarkable player. And I think he started uh, that Raider tr tradition of receivers that, you know, goes from Powell to Belletnikoff, Warren Wells, and so on and so forth. So uh, he was just a remarkable player. We were, I was blessed to have an opportunity to witness how good he was, which enabled me when I went out scouting to judge him based off of our path. That says a lot. So, Ron, I want to talk to you about the history of Raider acquisitions. This is a big one. Looking back at Art's career before he came to the Oakland Raiders, can you take us on that journey of Mr. Davis, yourself, everyone who was involved in the process here to get such a unique player at the time, and how difficult was that move to go out and get him? Well, I think that was all Al Davis. He did that before I came on board. Uh, he knew him from his experience of playing the New York Titans. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they had Powell and, and Maynard as, uh, as their two receivers, two wide receivers. And, uh, you know, he, uh, Al pulled that off. And he did it by a guaranteed contract. Mm -hmm. which is really was kind of like unheard of at that time. Uh, paid him all $25,000 <laughs> guaranteed contract. And uh, that won him over. What was he like as a teammate and a leader? Uh, a lot of our guests said 
He was a quiet leader at times, and then he'd have such explosive games and plays. What was he like from practice on the practice field and his efforts and how explosive he was on game day? No, he's a, he's a very serious uh, person, and uh, he uh, he represented himself well. Uh, it was all about, with him, about playing football and about what he deserves based off of his ability as a football player. And uh, I don't think you could, uh, there are a lot of guys uh, that, that you talk about being tough. Uh, Powell was really tough. That is a great point. I want to stay on that because, Ron, he transcended every era. If you look at the 81 touchdowns and the yards per catch and the touchdowns per game, you put him up against the all-time greats, and he's had to wait this long. As a senior finalist here, these numbers go from era to era, and they're so dominant. That's, I think you described it perfectly. That's what he was. He was a dominant player, and as uh, uh, it's, it's good a guy like uh, – Frank Cooney can put forth his name and get him get him where he is now as an opportunity to get into the Hall of Fame. He certainly deserves to be there, and it's nice to see that, that he's getting that type of recognition. Well, coming from a legendary Hall of Famer like you, it means a lot. Ron, thanks a lot for doing this. We couldn't do it without you, as you can tie our audience into the life and the career of our pal. Thanks so much. You bet. Thanks for having me. Coming up, we talk Eric Allen with three of his former teammates, Hall of Famer Tim Brown, the MVP Rich Gannon, and Hall of Fame defensive back Charles Woodson, next on the road to Canton. You're listening to Upon Further Review. I'm your host, Eddie Pascal. Good morning, Raider Nation. Welcome to Raiders Roundtable. JT along with Q Myers. He dissects the play quickly and makes the move to the football. We thank Ron Wolf and our other guests for helping us better understand the type of player Art Powell was. He was the centerpiece in Al Davis's new offense that rewired the game of football and the remnants of which we still see today. Powell is one of the three senior finalists that will be in the running for a gold jacket this year, and it's his time to finally get the credit he deserves. Another man who very much deserves that honor is all-time cornerback Eric Allen. The Pro Football Hall of Fame announced Allen would be one of their 15 finalists for the class of 2024. Eric has been a semifinalist for four years now, and this is his first time that he's been named a finalist, an honor that's long overdue because he's widely regarded as one of the best cover corners in the history of the NFL. In his 14-year NFL career, he played in 217 of a possible 224 games, grabbing 54 interceptions, which ranks 21st all-time. Eric Allen is deserving of a gold jacket. And to talk more about him, we welcome in Hall of Famer and former teammate Tim Brown. Okay, Tim, let's begin with your first recollections of Eric Allen, dating back to the great Eagles team with Reggie White to the years that he came to the Silver and Black. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, man, that defense they had back then in Philly was was a bad, bad defense, you know. Um, <clears throat> I believe we went there in 91, 92. I can't remember what it was, but the worst field in the history of football, you know, in the NFL at the time. Uh, but, man, we – we uh, it was tough. Tough day on us. That defense was pretty good. And, you know, anytime you have a guy like Eric on, on the corner, it pretty much eliminates one side of the field, right? So when you're over there – if you're going to get get something done, you got to really put some work in. And, you know, we made our efforts, but I don't think we were too successful that day. 
Tim, what was it like when he came to the Raiders and you practiced with them every day? Because you love the details of practice, and it sounds like everyone we're talking to, Eric Allen, stayed late after practice and got in extra work. What was that relationship with you competing against him at practice each day? Yeah, you know, you know, with only a couple of guys in my career with the Raiders, when you line up on them, you have to, you have to say, "Are we going live? Or what are we doing here?" Because, you know, if it's live, that's a whole different thing. But look, Eric was the the consummate pro, right? I mean, a guy you never had to worry about, didn't have to worry about being late, all that stuff. He was going to always be there, if, like you said, be there early and leave late. Uh, so from that standpoint. You know, it was just just a great, great teammate, man. One of those guys you wish, man, man, I wish we would have played a lot longer together than what we did. Uh, but I'm certainly glad that we got the years in that we were able to. Yeah, Tim, we've been talking about him playing opposite of Charles Woodson when he came and Charles came in that year. And Rod Woodson, another one who joined you in the Hall of Fame with a gold jacket. We're trying to get to the reason why Eric's waited so long. Now he's a finalist. And you had to wait a little bit long. And I remember interviewing you back in the day when you were waiting and you should have been inducted much earlier. What is the reason for Eric Allen now to be inducted into this class of the Pro Football Hall of Fame? Well, it's it's past time. It's past due. You know, and I think sometimes, you know, these uh, these voters, man, they, you know, they're, they're tra- they have this this program or whatever they, they want to say it is. And um, and sometimes it just doesn't work, man. I mean, it didn't work back with, you know, me and, and Chris Carter and Andre Reid. It didn't work, you know, what they were trying to do. No one could figure out. They went two or three years without putting either one of us in. So, uh, so I don't know exactly what's going on with Eric, but I just hope that it's time now, you know, that these folks understand, you know, that uh, this is the right time to put him in and let's get it done. You played against a lot of great corners. Schematically, what made Eric Allen different in his style of play? Bump and run, one-on-one, never played off. You know what I mean? If if he played off, they they forced him to play off. But, you know, I mean, he was a guy every day, every bit down, you knew his nose was going to be on your nose at the snap of the ball. And there was a fight to get off the line of scrimmage, you know. And, uh, you know, he was never a fast, fast guy. But, you know, when you look at him, you know, you never see him, you know, giving up the big plays because when you're able to stay on top of people, that's called great technique. And this guy was a technician at the line of scrimmage and, uh, you know, just, you know, a little shorter. So he's under your pads already. You know what I mean? But um, he was a handful, man, and uh, a guy I, I love competing against and certainly love competing with him. Hey, Timmy, finally, I know about your family and your faith and your kids and your family and how much that means to you. I mean, I've known Eric a while now. He's one of the best people I know. I, I've never heard anyone say a bad word about Eric Allen. Let's wrap it up with him as just a person, a father, a husband, and the impact he's had on your life as a friend and teammate. Yeah, man, look, I mean, when Eric came to the Raiders, man, he was right there with us and, you know, at the Bible studies and doing all that stuff with us. And, you know, you just knew that he was seeking for something deeper than than a great football career, man. And that's uh, that's what this thing is all about. And you can see him living that out now in his life. And it's, it's, it's really uh, uh, an incredible thing. You know, it shouldn't be such a big deal, but unfortunately in the world of football, it, it is uh, a big deal when you see guys really living their faith and living who they really want to be. Thanks, Timmy. Your voice carries a lot of weight on this show. We greatly appreciate you making time. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Coming up, MVP quarterback Rich Gannon joins the show to discuss what made Eric such a difficult cornerback to complete a pass against. To be a Raider is to be bold, powerful, and loyal. What's a Raider? Always a Raider. Raider Nation family is authentic. With the heart here in Las Vegas, we are often imitated, but can never be duplicated. Why? The autumn wind is a raider. Because there is only one nation. Keep up with the 2023 season by downloading the mobile Raiders app or visiting Raiders.com slash connect for scores, where to watch, and what's happening next. Having the ability to play for a team that has so much respect for the position and then have an opportunity to play 
with Charles and try and show him the way. And it was all about making plays. And we had great guys up front, you know, uh, D. Russ, Lance Johnstone, uh, Russell Maryland, uh, big, uh, big time players up front, Greg Beaker at linebacker. So it made it easy for me to kind of pinpoint, choose my spots. I was a great guy as far as studying, listen to some of the things that Willie Brown would go through and talk about. Uh, uh, it was just a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous time in my career to really kind of let it all like hang out. You know, the, the athleticism part of it, you know, the study and the preparation part of it, uh, the great coaching I received, and then ultimately just the shield and the Raiders and what I wanted that shield to come back to because it had been down for a couple of years. And I just wanted to be a part of a, a team that kind of brought that Raider mystique and that Raider play uh, back to the National Football League. Al Davis was notorious for seeking out older veterans who he knew could still play at a high level. And Eric Allen is one of the best examples. At the age of 33 in his first season donning the silver and black, he had five interceptions in only 10 games. Allen spent his final four seasons of his career with the Raiders and in total had 15 interceptions and four defensive touchdowns. Rarely do you see that level of production from a cornerback in his mid-30s. A lot of times, that's when the corners are making the transition to safety. We mentioned earlier that Eric was 21st overall in interceptions, but when you narrow that down to only those whose primary position was cornerback, he's tied for fourth all time. Allen was one of the best pure cornerbacks to ever play, and routinely his defenses relied upon him to cover the best receiver on the opposing team. His interception totals are even more impressive when you think about the quarterbacks actively avoiding throwing to his side. And our next guest is a quarterback who had to face him every week in practice, Rich Gannon. Rich, let's begin first, big picture. I'm going to get to Eric Allen as a player. Tell me about the man, the human being, and the friend of yours. You know, JT, I had the opportunity to compete against him you know, when he was in Philadelphia. And so I had great respect for the type of player that he was, but I didn't really know him personally until I came to the Raiders in 1999. And it became apparent to me very early on in the process, what, what type of leader he was, what type of teammate he was, how much he cared for the younger players. I got to know him really well and, and just admired and respected just how he treated others. He was great with the coaches. Uh, you know, I think you find out a lot about a person during the tough times. And there was some challenging times that first year in 1999, but EA always rose above it. He was always one of the first players uh, after practice to be in the locker room, talking to the players, encouraging the players in team meetings and player only meetings, you know, players always turned and looked to Eric Allen for answers. And I think he provided great leadership, great stability really. And, and what was a kind of a, a difficult season that first year in 1999, but uh, I, I've grown to admire and respect him uh, off the field. You know, you and I get the chance to be with him, uh, you know, obviously calling Raider games and, and uh, he's just, he's a phenomenal human being and uh, uh, someone I really look up to and admire. Rich, I know how seriously you took practice and you brought it to the game. And that's why you were an MVP in this league. Let's talk about Eric Allen at practice as your game was evolving on the path to becoming an MVP. How much did that defensive energy in practice help you? You know, JT, we were talking just before we jumped on and I was telling you about how you know, all the players that I played against defensively, whether they were teammates of mine, whether players that I competed against on different teams, I always felt like Eric Allen was one of the smartest defensive players that I ever played against. And I, I can share with you some of the reasons why. I just remember my first training camp in Napa and coming out of the huddle. And on one side was Charles Woodson, and on the other side was Eric Allen. Now, Charles was just a younger player at the time. And, of course, Eric was the wily KG vet. But I, did, I can just remember Eric was so savvy, so smart. He'd recognize formations. He'd recognize personnel groupings. He'd recognize splits. He'd stare down my eyes. He would jump certain routes. Uh, he, he was so difficult to beat. He would change up the looks. He'd show you press coverage. He'd bail. He'd show you off coverage. He'd come up and press. He'd line up inside. He'd jump outside. And it just made it so difficult to get a pre-snap read on what he was doing, the type of coverage he was playing. So he did a great job disguising his intentions. 
He did a great job recognizing and anticipating. That's one thing that made Eric Allen such a great player, his anticipation. And as I said, I think he was one of the smartest players that I ever played against. And I just watched him do it to other quarterbacks, uh, you know, every week. But in practice, you, you had to see when you were throwing in Eric Allen's direction. You had to see the separation because if you didn't see it, you'd pay the price. Yeah, Rich, you nailed it. He has 54 career interceptions, and you know the modern era as good as anybody. I mean, for him to wait this long and then to become a finalist finally, and there's not a lot of defensive backs in this class, and he didn't go from defensive back to safety. Not that there's anything wrong with that. He stayed and dominated at that position. And to play with Reggie White and then to play with the players that you mentioned, I mean, he crossed over from early in his career being dominant. But I wanted to follow up with him being a ball hawk because there's a lot of great young defensive backs in the league now that just can't get their hands on the ball and catch it and take it home the way Eric Allen was able to do it. Once he intercepted the ball, he was a weapon in changing field position. Yeah, you're right, JT. There are certain defensive backs that – you know, are very conservative. You know, they don't want to, they don't want to get beat. They don't want to get up the, 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 the big throw down the field. So they're going to keep everything in front of them. There are certain players at that position that are very aggressive. And I think Eric was one of those players. He trusted his recovery skills. And when he, the ball was in the air, he really felt like it was being thrown to him, not the intended receiver. And that's kind of the mindset with the great ones. You know, they think that every ball that's thrown in their direction is one that they can intercept. And I just think that, you know, he got his hands on a lot of balls. He he did a great job locating the ball when it was in the air. You watch Eric Allen on some deep throws. A lot of these defensive backs, even today, they don't even they don't they don't pick up the ball. You know, I mean, they don't even turn to find it. And Eric always did a great job of that. And then, as you said, once he got the ball in his hands, whether it was an interception, a fumble recovery, he could score. You know, he he had those offensive skills. You know, he had great speed, change of direction ability, stop and start ability, straight line speed. Um, he just had a great sense and a feel for the game. But, uh, you know, I, it's it just goes to show you that how difficult it is to get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame because Eric Allen is one of the greatest players I ever played against, one of the greatest players that I had the good fortune of be, be calling teammate. And to figure to, to, to think that he's not already in is kind of a shocker to me. Rich, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. I know EA appreciates you. You're the best, brother. Coming up, Hall of Famer and former teammate Charles Woodson stops by to talk about learning under Eric Allen and why he deserves to be in Canton. We're doing a game in Dallas. I remember. I've seen a lot more than that. No, I've never seen it where it goes all the way down. A sign that's fake is a good one. His pass is not. It's picked off by Eric Allen. Allen still spinning, still finding room, and Allen comes out of the pack. Eric Allen still on his feet. Eric Allen at the 40. Allen is going to go all the way. Eric Allen steps into the end zone, and the Eagles are ahead from 94 yards away. He caught that. I mean, just catching that interception was great, catching it behind him, and watch all these moves and spins and everything he does. This is all Eric Allen. I mean, he's running out of plays, jumping, his legs are going up and down, and he just runs away from everyone. NFL Films founder Steve Sable said that was the greatest interception return in NFL history. And it wasn't Eric's only one. He had a total of eight interceptions that he returned for touchdowns, and that was good enough for third at the time of his retirement and remains eighth most all time. Allen always had a knack for the big play. In 1993, as a member of the Philadelphia Eagles, he returned four interceptions for touchdowns, which was the NFL record until Cowboys corner Deron Bland broke that this season with five. Eric is the only player in NFL history with multiple seasons of three or more interceptions returned for touchdowns. We now welcome in a teammate who had a front row seat to multiple Eric Allen touchdown returns, Hall of Famer Charles Woodson. So, Charles, let's jump in. You come to the NFL with a Heisman Trophy, and there's Eric Allen right there with you. What were your early impressions of EA? Man, just, you know, uh, I came in and I got a lot of, um, you know, what I would say is professionals, you know, that I got to look up to. And uh, EA was one of those guys. Uh, he was a guy that, um, 
you know, always, you know, carried himself, carried himself with, with, with class. Um, he was uh, a great mentor. Like he, you know, he was one of the guys that they just took me right in and tried to show me the ropes, you know, tried to help me understand what it meant to be, you know, a, a, a young NFL player and just trying to guide me in the, in the right direction. And uh, it was always love, you know, right from the start. So, you know, I always appreciated, you know, my veterans when I got in, man, because those guys, they showed me the way. Charles, I know how many people you mentored. I want to stay on that. That's a really important part of your legacy on the way to the Hall of Fame. You came in with an organization with Al Davis and players like Eric Allen. That's a really solid foundation for you. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I always tell people when I came in, you know, I always had – you know, the the legends and, and guys like that to look up to, you know, in, in that building, you always had, you know, Hall of Famer Willie Brown, who was, you know, an, an assistant coach at that time in the DB's room. Um, you had Freddie Belitnikoff, and you just had these legends walking around all the time, man. And, and they just, they helped you understand what it meant to be a Raider, you know, what it meant to, you know, play in, play in the NFL and uh, try to hold yourself to a high standard and go out there and play hard each and every day. Um, and of course, you know, EA was was a part of that, you know, coming over, um, you know, being here my first year getting in, man, I got to just watch him uh, as a young 21, 22 year old and just watch the way a veteran is supposed to do it. And a guy that's done it at a high level for a long time. So um, I appreciated all, all of those guys. So, Charles, let's jump into the style of play of Eric Allen. He was a ball hawk with Reggie White and those great Philly teams, and then he comes to the Raiders, and he's still jumping routes. He's putting up massive numbers. This was a guy, when he got his hands on the football, not only did he intercept it, but he knew how to take it the other way. Yeah, he was – what he was was he's a, he was a smart player. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was, you know, one of the things that – I was able to continue to add on to my game is watching him and watching the way that he approached each game. He didn't play every game the same way. You know, some days, some games he pressed more. Some days was more of an off technique, uh, but he could do both of those things. And, uh, you know, I tried to pride myself in doing that as well. And, uh, you know, we would, you know, in drills, you know, he would, you know, take me to the side and say, okay, this is what I'm looking at when I'm playing off. You know, this is what I'm looking for. You know, it, when it's man to man, you know, this, this split or that split. And so I got to, you know, pick up certain things from him and then just watching him do it, you know, watching him do it, watching him make plays. Uh, you know, you're saying to yourself, like, man, I need to make some plays too, like like EA is doing. Uh, mm -hmm. But he was a veteran. Uh, he was a savvy veteran. And and he knew when to pick his spots and, and when to make the play, man. So it was it was great for me to be able to watch him when I first got into the league, watch a guy do it um, the way he did it at the level that he did it for the, for the, for the amount of time that he did it. Charles, as we wrap this up, I want to make the comparison with three players. You, Rod Woodson, had brilliant careers, not only as corners, but you transitioned to safeties and played at a Hall of Fame level. EA was a primary corner. And as a primary corner, he's fourth on the all-time list. Let's make the case on why he should be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame as a pure cornerback. Well, the one thing you have to look at, I think, for any player is longevity. And uh, he had longevity in this league. And if you're going to play a long time and you're going to be a starting corner or, or any position um, for that matter. But if you're going to start in this league um, at corner, you know, every year you, you got younger and younger players coming in at the wide receiver position that you have to run around with. And for a guy who um, uh, played as long as he did to still be able to do that, um, as many interceptions that he had with us late in his career with the Raiders, this is a guy who uh, was able to withstand whatever came at him, you know, for a long period of time. And, and he never stopped making plays. So I think for anybody that's looking at anybody that's worthy enough to go into the Hall of Fame, it's Eric Allen. And uh, hope to see him there soon, man. I can't help, I can't wait to, to, to help walk him in with his family um, and welcome him to the Hall of Fame, man. So let's get it done. Charles, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for taking time out of your schedule. We'll see you soon. Appreciate it. Thanks, JT. We thank Charles and all of our guests today as we continue to push for our pal and Eric Allen to take their rightful place among the league's greatest players of all time. The Raiders have 30 Hall of Famers enshrined in Canton, and that number needs to increase to 32 later this year. Two players who played at the top of their game for the most storied franchise in NFL history. It's time they were properly honored. I'm JT The Brick. Thanks for joining us on the road to Canton.